you are going to meet one of the great watercolor masters. Please welcome Keiko Tanabe. Wow, we are so honored to have you, Keiko. Hi, good morning, Eric. So good nice morning. to see you, as always. Thank nice you so much for inviting me today. Well, it's uh, it's a beautiful day here in Austin, Texas. Where are you? Uh, I'm in San Diego, uh, San Diego. No North San Diego County. Yeah, it's okay. a beautiful day today here as well. And you're from Japan originally. Yes, I am. I'm from Japan, the city of Kyoto. Uh, we, we'll have to go paint there someday. I have I've not been to Japan. Oh, I really hope you will someday. I'd like that. You and I had a wonderful experience. Um, kind of, I think it was kind of when we, uh, right around the time we first met, you were on the faculty of the Plein Air Convention for our watercolor right. stage. Yes, and, it was in Santa Fe. In Santa Fe. And then uh, Pierre at Sennelier had uh, had me come by his booth and he, he basically videotaped me doing my first watercolor, which was a disaster. <laughs> oh, no, no. I wish I could show you my very first watercolor painting. Yours is much, much better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Well, uh, what are you going to do for us today? You're obviously going to do something in watercolor. Well, yes. Uh, well, as you know, I'm an avid Prania painter. I like to capture the sense of place, sense of time. Well, since it's harvest season, I think I'm going to do something that's um, that shows harvest season. Terrific. Well, uh, we're going to go ahead and let you get started because uh, I want to make sure you have plenty of time. And uh, so now this is nice. We can see your your palette and your yeah, I'm getting your ready. Canvas. And I'm okay. ready. Why don't you start out by telling us about your colors, your brushes, your panels? Oh, okay, sure. Um, here I have my palette. Uh, this is the palette I use even in my studio, but I mainly for outside. But today I'm using almost the same size that I use outside, so I'm using my planner palette. And this one can hold 16 colors. Um, I think it's a very basic, um, you know, the, uh, the choice, uh, choice wise. So I have my yellows right here, and an orange, and reds, and blues, and some browns, and then some other colors that I like. And these are mainly my uh, the different type of types of greens. So this is my palette, and uh, I, I like the size. I can hold it in my hand. Um, it's very compact. And my brushes, I have a variety of brushes. But actually, I always say to my students, I only need two to make a painting. So why two? Because my painting process is usually two steps. I do the wash in the beginning and I finish uh, with uh, details, dogs and details. So the first part of the painting, I normally use something like this or this or this, so depending on maybe the size of the, uh, the paper. And so that's why that size, size varies. And the second step, I, I would choose something a little smaller and then maybe a little different type of hair, something like this. So actually I have a many, but like I said, I only need two to and, finish. And, and maybe my main brush is sitting there. So the, sorry, Eric. I said the most important question was, do you have an easel brush clip sitting there for your brushes? Oh, oh yes. I was going to tell you, see? Oh, you do? You <laughs> oh, I, was I don't need joking. it today, I, but, right. because, but, well, but this is also, risky. that was risky. Actually, I, I have several said, well, I, I used one inside because it is a brush holder right here. Yeah. Right. So, I, but usually I use it outside. It's very, very handy and I, I can't live without it. So thank you, Eric. <laughs> Wonderful product. Okay. All we right. have people watching from all over. We have Brazil, the Philippines. Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. Oh, man. I'll, I'll read them out from time to time as they pop in. I know once I start okay. talking about them, everybody starts. Oh, well, I'm already doing things. So I, I, I like keeping conversation going. Eric, I really enjoy talking with you always. Uh, and also the, our audience. So um, I was just reading this part of the paper to demonstrate a little different technique. And I'm really excited to be on the faculty for the watercolor line. And what I'm planning to do is to show you um, a demo, complete demo. But today, I'm going to just um, show you. I just have a little. Um, I'm just going to let you taste a little bit of what I'm going to show you and what I got like. So I'm going to be talking about other techniques and cutters and why I choose these techniques and cutters to make my own painting. But some of those techniques, that's what I want to show you a little bit of today. And one is a very. Um, this is very unique. 
when you use water media, uh, you, something you cannot do if you use something else. So that is uh, the wet and wet. I think this is one of the most uh, important techniques all watercolorists need to, uh, to learn. And uh, so wet and wet means you paint into the wet paper. So that's why I wetted the paper right here. And I'm sure if you use watercolor, you know what it means. So I'm going to try to drop a color inside. So I just mix this uh, purple and just drop it inside. And actually, the brush doesn't have to uh, has to uh, have to touch the paper. You can just drop it, or you can actually put it in, put the paint inside uh, manually with a brush. Yeah. And then just after that, you just watch and enjoy how the paint um, spreads into the wet area. So uh, that's one technique. It's called wetting wet. Another one is um, this side. I'm going to do uh, something similar. I'm going to just drop the paints. But of course, the paper is dry, so it's not going to paint doesn't spread. And of course, if you paint like this, you can really uh, control uh, where you want your paint to go. So um, this way, you don't have control, but it's fun. Uh, this you have total control. Uh, this is also fun as well. But it's the effect, it's the outcome that it's very important because I believe um, by knowing which technique you want to use in your painting. Um, can create a totally different uh, atmosphere and a mood in your painting. So it's really important as an artist, we know what kind of techniques you want to use. So today in my painting demo, I like to show you mainly the wet and wet technique, but also I use um, the dry, and this is a dry technique. And so wet and dry, dry and dry, dry and dry, there are uh, several ways to do it. Uh, so, but that's one of the things we all need to learn, especially this one. Okay, so I have, I started at, um, this painting, as I said to Eric, I wanted to show, create the harvest scene today. And since um, I don't have enough time to complete a painting, I started a little, a little bit. And then I'm gonna paint on it. But right now, um, if the paper is dry, so I'm gonna just wet the area where I wanna um, use wet and wet technique. So this oh, is I a hadn't seen that brush. before. I've, I've pe seen people wet the whole thing or spray it, but I've never seen somebody just wet where they want to work. Why do you do that? Oh, so say that again, Eric. Sorry. What, uh, what is the purpose behind wetting just an area you're going to paint? Oh, so that um, the paint doesn't spread all over. Okay. Because the, if that happens, you lose control, and then and maybe depending on the color you're using into the wet and wet, um, you know, you may not, not want to see the color in that area and, uh, so, in the different area. So you don't want to wet that area, uh, just to, uh, avoid the risk of that particular color to go into that area. So really you have to know what, what color you want to use and here and what color you want to use there. So it's uh, good to have a color, um, reference uh, before you begin. And then, um, but of course, it's always fun just to experiment and see what happens. And, but um, this way, if you just strategically wet the paper, you can sort of control the flow. Um, yes, you do uh, control the flow. So I just waited this uh, area, and then I'm gonna just drop the paint. Um, this I'm using the raw sienna, and this is a pumpkin patch. And, so I'm gonna use a different color as well. But first this, and I'm using this Chinese brush to do this wash. So since I'm waiting, I uh, waited the paper first and color gets diluted on the paper. So it's um, it's gonna look very transparent. And I also you, you, uh, chose a transparent pigment. To me, transparency is very important, although I do use some opaque colors. So the pumpkins, so I just painted uh, the dirt part of the pumpkin uh, patch. But the pumpkins, I'm dropping in this orange. I didn't draw everything. I don't always draw everything. But I think at this point, I know where I want to see pumpkins. So that's where I'm putting the oranges. But if you notice, like this pumpkin and this pumpkin, I didn't want the paper behind them so that it created a more controlled hard edges. Yeah. Right? But other pumpkins, I, I'm dropping this color into the wet area. So 
the pain spreads and runs. So two different types of uh, look in the pumpkins. I think uh, the, the painting will look more interesting, even if you're painting the same thing, if you show them differently. But you don't want, especially the wedding wet, since you have to kind of lose control, um, you have to keep an eye on uh, the, what's happening until the paint gets dry, actually. And lots of uh, accidents happen at this stage. And, but no need to feel pan uh, no need to feel panicked. You, you just have to enjoy and keep an eye. And if the paint spreads too much, then you have to take action. So I'm putting a little bit of a different color. Um, it's not just orange in the pumpkin patch. So um, uh, the, the leafy part. Whoops, that was an accident actually. The paint just dripped from my brush. Do you have a reference so, photo on this? On it. Are you using a reference photo or are you just doing this out of your head? Oh, this is uh, actually, I am um, I painted this uh, place a few times. So I'm working from memory. I do this a lot, Eric. I, I do take a lot of photos like uh, many other people do. But more and more, I rely on my memory and my impression and then... Initially, when I do a drawing, I may be looking at the photo, but most of the time I stop looking any after that. So when I actually paint, uh, I just work with the impression I have in my mind. So this one, since I have experience painting there, and I visited this uh, particular pumpkin patch and, and you know several times, especially when my son was young, I have good memories. Memory training is a great thing to develop as an artist. I agree, especially uh, for plan. But I think I, I can say this by painting plan air a lot. And I've been painting plan air uh, maybe 15 years. And it trained me to develop uh, the, the memory uh, because you don't really have much time uh, to paint. You have to finish quickly. So you look at the subject and I have to memorize and you know what you're going to paint right after that, and then we don't we don't see as many watercolorists painting in plein air as we do other mediums. What, um, why do you think that is, and what what would your encouragement be to people uh, about getting out and painting plein air? Well, that's uh, what I um, just what I was saying. I think uh, you will really develop the the skill, the memory skill. Uh, that's important. Uh, even when you're a studio painter, I think it's important because you don't want to be just keep uh, and you don't want to just keep looking at your reference. You have to spend more time looking at your painting and just ask yourself, well, what does this painting need for me to finish so you can move on uh, quickly? And I think uh, especially watercolor and then if you're trying to uh, create a kind of impressionistic look, uh, you have to paint fast. So if you paint slowly, you get a different uh, feel in your painting, which is great too. But especially the loose look, um, that's what I like. Uh, I believe uh, speed uh, is one of the important factors. So to be able to do that, that uh, well, to paint fast means I, I think uh, you are able to make quick decisions. So um, how to do that, I think uh, you have to uh, you have to develop the skill, observation skill first, and then you have to make it, um, you know, um, a prediction almost. So what's going to happen next? Uh, and then to memorize quickly what you just saw, and then predict what's going to happen next, and then a work from both sides almost. Uh, but that can be overwhelming in the beginning. But I think... Uh, I was not really aware of that's what I was doing, but looking back at 15 years of experience in planning painting, I think I sort of developed that uh, skill uh, by going out uh, and paint a lot. And of course, and I got discouraged many times, but I never wanted to quit. So it was always a great learning experience. Hey, even a bad day of painting is a good day. Oh yes, I agree. I always say, uh, as long as you learn something, 
and you, you win. Uh, we shouldn't worry too much about the painting result. Of course, we want to go back, you know, go home with a good painting, but it doesn't happen all the time. <clears throat> Do you have a preferred brand of papers and colors, brushes? Yes, I like uh, Fabriano, and also I, I like Arches. And then I used uh, several other brands um, before, Waterford and Windsor Newton. They're all good. It works for me. But I always tell my students, uh, uh, you really have to find a paper that works for you because each paper is different. And um, because the manufacturers have a different uh, way of making. Uh, so it's really important for us artists to try and test the products we use. Um, not just for paper, you know, pa uh, paints, brushes as well. And it takes time to learn. So I always give myself at least three months when I get a new product uh, to test it. And uh, Hello, Netherlands. Yeah. Hello, England. Hello, Kazakhstan. <clears throat> Hello, um, Niagara Falls, Sweden, Hello. Quebec. San Francisco. Well, I won't start naming state state the states because I'll get in trouble for not mentioning everybody. Great to have you all. So I did a well, it still looks a little abstract, uh, but I wanted to show you the wet and wet techniques. Uh, so I first dropped in the colors of the dirt and then the, the colors of pumpkin and the leaves, and then and the, after that I put some shadows. Of course, it's not finished yet. But uh, this this way, um, the paper is still wet, uh, where it uh, wet it initially, and because uh, the subsequent uh, steps, and I want to drop in colors, and those colors are also heavily diluted. So in in, in uh, essentially, I kept adding paper, uh, paper water to the same area, so that's why the paper is still quite uh, moist, not terribly wet. If uh, I don't really advise to paint uh, on the paper that is too wet, because you know, as you can see, the paper buckles a little bit, so it's, uh, it becomes more difficult to control the flow. Of course, um, it is water; we're dealing with water, so it runs from the higher uh, area to the lower area. So you really have to make sure once you start seeing the paper buckle, um, you have to really make sure the the colors are staying where you want to see them. And then if, there too, if there's too much on it, you have to remove um, using tissue or the brush, clean brush or tissue, or by actually tilting the paper. That's sometimes I do uh, by tilting the paper, by holding the paper. That's why I like uh, keeping the, uh, the paper um, not really fixed to the easel or to the, the painting surface so that I can hold the paper in case I have to. So the control, uh, yeah, it is uh, interesting that we don't want to control, uh, especially the impression, impressionists. <laughs> we want to let things happen almost on the, on the canvas or paper. We don't want to control too much uh, because that creates a different look and we're not after that kind of look. And, well, what's um, interesting yeah. is that, you know, your focal point is sharp edges and uh, everything else is kind of blending off into the distance. And so it really is drawing your eye to the focal point. Well, thank you. Yeah, so this, uh, I think uh, I can keep going, but it's uh, almost done, this part. I wanted to create a more abstract look in the, in the pumpkin pads. And another technique I wanted to show you, it's called a negative painting. And that is also very important, especially for the light, uh, because um, to capture light, I'm sure all artists uh, uh, think about that, how to do that effectively. But I think in watercolor, negative painting is one of the um, the good ways to do that. So negative painting means you paint around the shape, right? So this is uh, something I wanted to show you. Maybe I'll use the top parts. Uh, so there's a barn behind this, uh, these people. Right now, may, you may see the people, but not very clearly, right? So by placing this color uh, behind one of the people working on in the pumpkin patch, uh, you will start see the shape more clearly. Yeah, this is... Uh, uh, the farmer, but actually a father of a little boy, 
next to him. He has a straw hat. And then maybe I will give him some clothes and like this. Sri Lanka is watching. Dubai oh, is hi. watching. Uh, hi, everybody. Egypt. <laughs> Philadelphia, Wonderful. that's great. Wonderful. Somebody asked what kind of um, is very air tripod or setup do you use? Uh, I, when I'm in the studio, I have a tabletop easel. Uh, but today I'm uh, painting on my table, uh, just flat table. And then what about uh, when you go outdoors? When I go outside, I use a uh, plein air easel, for, um, especially designed for watercolor race. Uh, you have it's a called plein air pro. You use? Uh, actually, I use that inside as well sometimes. So I did a little bit of um, negative painting uh, here and there around the buildings. Over there, I placed some uh, trees. So by placing dogs right next to the light, that's how we make a contrast. But if you do a negative painting very well uh, by placing dogs around the lights, uh, you can create a very dramatic effect. So that's, but actually uh, I did both uh, the negative painting and positive painting. So here is a positive painting for the barn. But here it's a positive painting for that palm tree. But either way, then you can create a contrast. But I think a negative painting is a little bit harder because for obvious reason, because you have to go around the shape and the painting very carefully. And uh, it seems like uh, um, the people, that some watercolorists uh, avoid doing that because it's harder. But it's really worth uh, trying. But again, I think in a painting, you have to show different techniques. So if you have too much negative painting or too much positive painting, to me, it's not well, well balanced. I like to see both. Uh, and I try to do both in my painting. Hello, Belgium. Hello, Norway. Hi, everybody. Northern Ireland, Austria. Wow. Oh, this is so much fun. Well, your program is very popular, Eric. <laughs> well, it's you. They're tuning in for you, not for me. No, they follow you. We all do. And I really thank you for doing this. Uh, so uh, every day, really. Somebody said you use N Plein Air Pro easel in the field. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I just yeah, got I one of those. It's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful product. As a matter of fact, I just ordered parts for a second one so I can have one at the lake and one here. Yeah. Well, actually, I have several. Uh, I, there's always I, one I don't in my car. Any particular products, and I, I try them all and I like them all. Every one of them is different. but Yeah, but this one is especially made for watercolor. Uh, it's a very. Good. I mean, they thought of everything we need. Watercolor is has a special need. Well, the only thing they haven't provided is a, somebody to carry it for me. Oh, <laughs> that's something. Maybe I'll talk to them. <laughs> yeah. I need a I need a Sherpa. Well, I'm sure you uh, you will find it out of the volunteers. Yeah, is, well, uh, my kids my my kids should be volunteering. Hello, Scotland. Um, that's what kids are for, but unfortunately, they're in college. I mean, fortunately and unfortunately. Uh -huh. Well, can I volunteer? <laughs> I know you travel to all these uh, exotic places. Yeah, you know, it's funny. We, we, I was at Full Color Week, and somebody said, you know, you, need, you really need somebody to kind of be your assistant at all these events. I'll come to all of the events. All you got to do is pay for me to go to the events. It's like, yep. See? Yep. Well, I'd be happy to be a volunteer. <laughs> A lot of people yes. are trying to get into that Russia trip. Yes, we. I do travel a lot. At least I used to before COVID. Uh, I I missed that part. Um, it will return. 
Uh, I, I'm sure that right now. Uh, Hello, Chennai, I don't know. In, India. Yes, but I, I do. I a little donkey, yeah. Uh, but I do enjoy meeting artists online as well. That's uh, something I never thought uh, I would like. Uh, but it's really fun. I made a lot of artist friends, actually, in the last uh, several months. Um, artists are I, such wonderful people. They tend to be happy people. Yes, I think so. I, we, we're doing something we love, so how can we be unhappy? Yep, that's right. Yeah, so I uh, did a lot of a wedding wet right here, um, but I wanted to do uh, something a little bit different. So I worked on the dry paper in the background and also the figures as well. And this way, this painting has a little different look. Uh, but uh, again, I don't want to have two, two different types of paintings in one. So even here, I, I, it was a little bl blurry and more abstracted. But I wanted to add a little more definition, which I will do a little bit more of actually to, oh, to finish. Piece. And uh, in the background, it's uh, there's a there's more harder edges. But in behind it, what I did already before this demo, I'm showing the farther uh, the distant distant area. I'm showing more soft edges. So together, I I think. Uh, um, you know that this paint, or well, this part of a painting, has a coherent look um, in in terms of edges, and I really believe it's the edges that create a different mood in a painting. So this painting, this scene, can be definitely painted in a totally different way. So more harder edges, or more softer edges, or more different kinds of edges, and uh, and also colors too. They contribute in creating different types of mood. Um, but I wanted to talk more about edges today, so I'm going to just con uh, focus on that. But it's always my goal to create a balance in my painting. And uh, as long as uh, it's there, uh, when, I, uh, when I try to decide if my painting is finished, as long as there's a nice balance in a painting, I know it's uh, quite finished. Or at least I can just put down my brush and then look at it tomorrow. And then maybe another day I'll find something else to add if my painting needs more. So I'm as watching the, the comments, everyone. Somebody said the Dutch word for easel or the, is our donkey is easel. I don't know if that's true. I have to have somebody chime in on that. Uh, you guys mm -hmm. make sure that you leave comments because uh, tomorrow you could win the uh, Plein Air Magazine apron, uh, which is always nice anywhere in the world. And it can be on the live or on the replays because we check all the comments. Wonderful. Okay. So, yeah, I, um, I, I'm only showing a part of a painting, but it's an important part of a painting. Absolutely. And uh, the rest of the painting on this side, uh, I have more pumpkin patch and uh, that remain the, the same, same kind of feel. But it's a focal point. And uh, yeah, focal point is important. And I think every painting, I, that's what I look for when I look at a painting. So that's what I try to do in my painting as well. Um, how do you get those white spots in the in the background? It looks like you just dribbled water on them, or how did, did you? Right, like like this. Yeah, I splatter. Um, when you flick a brush, um, they put a little bit of water inside the brush, and you just move your brush quickly like this in this motion, and the water gets uh, released, and then it lands on the paper to create that kind of effect. But that has to be done when the paper is a little wet. Yeah, so if that's water. Dry. That's just water with no pigment in it, on top of something that already has pigment on it. Right, right. So I I did a wash using a little color, and then on top of that, before the paper was dry, I splattered. It's uh, it's another technique called the splattering, and and then of course I did I just did a few minutes ago in the pumpkin patch where you see a little dots. By this time, I use a little bit of color. So you don't always have to use just water. You can do this with the color as well. 
All right. But the important thing is to do that at the right moment, meaning the paper, when the paper is slightly wet, not too wet, uh, not too dry. So timing is very important. Okay. Hello, France. Welcome. Yeah, so I think um, this, you know, by working little by little in the pumpkin patch, and if I feel uh, if my the whole painting needs a little bit more definition, I can um, do the negative painting actually for the pumpkins. I darken around the pumpkins. So, especially where I see the orange, I have a little bit here, a little bit there. So I can do a negative painting to create more pumpkins, even though I didn't draw them. I don't really draw everything. I like finding shapes this way uh, as a painting uh, nears the end. If well, I I, feel, that's what I like is that you haven't, the temptation would be to draw a full circle around each of those pumpkins instead of just, you've got little spots where you've got an edge. That's, that's mm -hmm. really very pleasing. And your brain says that's a pumpkin. Right, right. That's uh, that, you know, I think an important thing, and and I, and I always try to keep that in mind. Uh, don't don't paint it early, and uh, and of course I'm not interested in doing that. But sometimes we have to re allow ourselves to to be very creative, right? So we don't really have to be a slave to what we see. We are making our own scene in our painting. So even if it's not there, um, you you can add things, or if you don't think uh, you don't need a certain elements in the scene, you can eliminate them. So the editing is another thing uh, I will be talking about in uh, the plan, uh, my demo for what I got alive, because that's uh, one thing we should do as a, as artists. We should um, feel uh, even we shouldn't even feel that we have to paint just because it's there. That's a tough thing, especially in plein air painting is the, you know, you, you find two or three things that seduce you that make you want to paint them. And yet if you have more than one focal mm -hmm. point, you're going to mess mm -hmm. it up. Right. Right. Yes. You use an interesting word. It seduces you. <laughs> yes. Maybe Sometimes I have to fight the temptation, um, but it, and ultimately I, I learned uh, to ask my, for a question, do I need this in my painting? Do I like it? And I just have to be honest. If my answer is no, I won't paint. So, but to, uh, being honest, that part, and I, I, I have to admit, I didn't do it in the beginning. And I almost felt compelled to paint just because it's there. Um, and, but I don't know now uh, why it was so difficult for me to say no. Um, right now, I, I have no problem. <laughs> I think I changed. And how how did I learn uh, to say no? I don't know. I well, think you probably I, have to do a lot of bad paintings. Maybe. <laughs> maybe that's the reason. I think the hardest thing for me is to abandon something that I have fallen in love with. You know, if I see something in a painting that I just know isn't working, but I've spent a lot of time on it. Oh, I know what you mean. Yes, it happened to me a lot. And also, uh, you start out, and then because you think it's it's a really perfect view, and then you know this is a brand new situation, and as and it gets better and better as you paint, and you feel compelled. To, I mean, you want to change your painting too, <laughs> as you see in front of you gets better and better, especially the light. That's when I feel very. Um, uh, tempted to change my painting but this too I have learned because I ruined my paintings many many times uh, by changing <laughs> the light oh, in my boy. painting so I think it was Don Whitelaw who was on recently and she said sometimes I'll keep I'll, I'll have a, a 16 by 20 with three or four canvases taped off and that way rather than the temptation of painting something else I see into the painting I'll just go ahead and start another painting and, and do mm -hmm. a different view. That way mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm scratching that itch. Mm -hmm. And if you're right, like, that's, uh, that's, what, that's excellent. Uh, yeah. I like that. Um, 
But for me, uh, again, the planner, if I see the scene developing and improving, actually, I just take a photo and uh, just, um, you know, that day, I can't do that painting. I just work from a photo. If I really want to paint that, um, the different different light, uh, at least I have photo reference. Or yeah. I, I would try to go back to the place if it's possible another day, um, a little bit later, maybe. So that way I get to paint from life. So, but I just learned um, it's not advisable to change a painting once you start with a plan, certain plan, especially I think it's um, for the watercolor, very difficult to change, uh, change the values actually. And I, I kept saying light, but it's really about the values. So something, especially something that's dark, uh, um, you know, I mean, something that's light, it should be light. If you already dark in there, uh, you can't really change it back to light. That's very difficult on the watercolor. So I always make sure my, uh, that I don't make the mistake. And I tell my students, um, you got to save light. And you, you can all, almost always just think about that aspect uh, throughout the painting process and not worry worrying about anything else because that's really more hard people inspired. watching from india by the way uh, i know there's a big water watercolor uh popularity in india here's a question from warsaw poland uh it says can you tell why sometimes the scene finishes looking like the interior of a film set studio not sure exactly what that question means yeah i don't know what it means so I, get, I think that's a compliment. Oh, well, thank you. If it is, I appreciate that. If it's not, oh, well. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, I mean, I'm happy to answer any questions, but uh, just, I don't know how to answer that one. So yeah, yeah. maybe maybe, uh, maybe that person could define that question a little bit more for us. Uh, okay. Rosso Komen. That's hello from Rosso comment. I don't know where that is. This is very inspiring. You're Thank doing you. a good job. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. And when when uh, when you're on on watercolor live, you won't have to. People won't have to listen to me making my comments. So are you what are you doing now? You're going in and putting highlights in. Oh uh, yes. Uh just adding uh, fun bits actually then you know i don't really have to do the, those little things at the very end i call the finishing touches and are but, you using an opaque white for that yes i have um titanium white in my palette right here which i don't actually don't want to use but in case uh, i really have to i want to and it's always there uh although i try to make my the, the, my painting look as transparent as possible okay uh, which i i i prefer but sometimes opaque uh, actually i i did i did use a little bit of opaque colors and that like in some of the greens and also i don't know if you can see some uh, splatter uh, i added at, at towards the end is also opaque color and of course, if I have a white, uh, I can mix a different color to it to make um, a different opaque color that I don't have. So it's very useful. Uh, but uh, like I said, once you lose the light, uh, like here, I mean, I don't really need it. But if it's there, maybe uh, if I feel it will make the painting look better, uh, I have a way. So yeah. I don't really yeah. mind yeah. using yeah. opaque or white color this way. Well, fabulous. Uh, well, we've learned that Rose Common is in Ireland. I've learned something new today. Uh, hello to Mexico, Calabasas, it looks like. Uh, Hi. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. We're here every day at 12 noon on uh, Facebook, noon uh, New York City time, Eastern time. All right. Well, we got about uh, we got about five minutes left, Keiko, and I'll just let you now. You're laying in a little bit of shadow, it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I may. Well, I won't be able to finish. It's a much uh, bigger painting. I'm only showing a part of it. 
Um, so, but an important part. So I hope, uh, I, I'm glad if you enjoyed it and if it was useful for you. What you brand of paint some... are these? There's a Holbein sticker there on the easel. Is that Holbein paint? Um, no, actually, my paints are mainly from Sennelier. Sennelier. I do have one color from Holbein. Okay. Yeah, my palette is Holbein, actually. Well, my paints are Sennelier. And I love Sennelier because... Uh, it's uh, I, I think it's it's perfect for planning painting, especially because it's honey based. It doesn't get totally dry. That used to be a problem for me uh, when I used a little. Uh, I mean, different brands, and sometimes uh, it got dry too quickly. Um, so and I you, found are myself the that you're using uh, uh, tubed watercolor paints. Yes, I prefer uh, squeezing fresh paints out of tubes. So um, these are all from tubes, okay? And then whenever I run out, I add more. But usually I let it dry a little bit inside like this and then travel. Um, I close the palette and I travel with it. So um, this way, I think and I, I have enough to make maybe two or three paintings, but it depends on the color. Some colors I use a lot. So maybe I, I may pack a few tubes of paints, um, my, you know, very common colors for me. But um, yeah, it's very um, portable uh, and you don't really have to worry about uh, them drying too much. And, yeah. And well, then, I, I, I'll tell you something that, that's been really on my mind lately is that I, I always carry a small watercolor set, not even that mm -hmm. big, uh, in my suitcase at all times because there are times when I just don't even think to bring paint. I might be on a business trip or something. Uh, but I, I really have decided I have to double down and really learn watercolor. And that's one of the reasons that, that I think watercolor live is going to be so good for me is because I, you know, I tend to be an oil painter, but there are just times I don't want to carry my oils or e mm -hmm. even a, a oh, bunch of heavy too. Yes. Watercolor is the best, especially for traveling. It's so much easier. Um, and cleaning. Uh, I mean, you just have to wipe. That's all. <laughs> well, Switzerland. I'm going to take a group to paint in Switzerland. That's that's one of the next things. Oh, I'm that's doing. exciting. Yeah, yeah. What I what I need people to do is in the comments. You need to put where would you like to go as a group to go painting, and uh, I'll I'll gather that information and then. Uh, but don't put it down if you're not going to go. If you, if you say, okay, I'd go with you if you did a trip to name insert here. And maybe maybe we could get uh, Keiko to, to go with us to, to lead us. Oh, to, I love to. Go so I can send and, the request uh, Help us discover Japan. That would be fun. Oh, actually, yes. Many people told me uh, that's uh, one of the places they dreamt of going to paint. I'll be happy to help Eric if you're gonna plan one. Carry carry the bags. I know. I guess. Yes. <laughs> Switzerland and Norway. Switzerland's coming up. Yep. Egypt. All right. Wow. Yeah. This is really great. Well, how about you come back on camera and we'll just okay. Do a quick, All right. Uh, yeah. That's fabulous. Thumbs up. Applause. Thank you. Maybe I'll show you this, my studio a little bit. <laughs> oh, let do a quick. Let's do a quick view of your studio. Yeah, I just finished the uh, the commission piece, uh, the vineyard, and it looks like your living room. Is the studio your living room? Well, it's both. Uh, yeah. Whenever I have guests. Nice. <laughs> looks like an old 1930s bungalow. Oh, thank you. Well, it's gonna change. I'm trying to. I'm gonna change maybe over the holidays a little bit. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Keiko, for doing this today. Um, so, what do you tell me? What your thoughts are about this this group of people we've put together on Watercolor Live? Have you seen anything like that? Um, I, oh no! This is the very uh, the first and very exciting events for the whole watercolor community. So, thank you so much for doing this. It's really exciting. You're really putting us together and, and make a huge event. So, um, well, but the watercolor community is very close knit, uh, but there are people who don't know us. So I think uh, it's, it's really great. Well, I and, and I think the other thing, uh, one of my goals is that uh, a lot of artists have told me some things that they would like to overcome 
in the watercolor world. You know, for instance, there are some galleries have have old school thinking about watercolor, you know, because they, they think that it's fugitive, but of course the colors aren't fugitive anymore or mm -hmm. that uh, they have trouble selling things under glass. And of course, a lot of watercolors aren't even using glass anymore. So there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of things we need to overcome as, uh, as a group, as an industry, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think getting everybody together and something like Watercolor Live, we get the community together. We have these breakout rooms. People can talk to each other, get to know artists from all over the world. We have painting together at the end of every day where we're all on one big giant call. It's a, it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll have I have scenes up there you can paint. And uh, so we're excited about it. So I'm so honored that you would be part of the, the faculty of the very first. Oh, I'm so honored. Live. Thank you, Eric. Thumbs up, applause for Keiko Tanabe. I, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur uh, and Plein Air Magazine, Streamline Art, where we do all kinds of things for artists. You know, we have retreats, we have magazines, we have online virtual events. Thank you again for watching today. I will be here tomorrow at 12 noon, like every day, God willing. Make sure to tell us where you would like to go on future trips. I'm taking a group uh, to Russia on a plein air painting trip for two weeks in September uh, next year. And uh, I have a, an event in the Adirondacks and we'll have a fall color week in the Adirondacks this year, but we will be doing more events now that my kids are in college. I'm free. Yay. All right. Keep your head in the game. Stay positive. Stay upbeat. Do something you love. Do not let the news bring you down. Last night we were watching the news and we were like, oh, this is awful. And so we uh, we put we put on we, we started watching uh, uh, a, uh, a series called Schitt's Creek and uh, or Schlitz Creek, something like that. <laughs> I don't want to get any bad uh, bad language in here. Anyway, it was so funny and it was fun just to laugh. You gotta, you gotta take care of yourself and laugh. And this morning I had the music on, I was dancing around the studio, just grooving to the tunes and it just makes you feel so good. And so if you're, you're finding yourself feeling a little down, you've got to be deliberate. You got to do things that make you feel upbeat, do what you love, try some new things. It will be good for your head. I will see you tomorrow at 12 noon.